Hello students, looking at current affairs for 20th June, the news items picked up from the Hindu newspaper are these 15, we'll look at them in detail. The first one, panel will study one nation, one poll issue. So a committee will be formed by Narendra Modi government to prepare a road map for one nation, one election. So this has been announced after a four hour meeting which took place with the leaders of or rather the presidents of 21 political parties. 11 political parties did not come for the meeting which the Prime Minister had convened. This include Congress and other parties like Trinamool Congress, Samajwadi Party, Aam Party, RJD etc. Among the NDA allies too, Shiv Sena was missing. So this was a 21 political party uh, meeting of the uh, presidents of 21 political parties came and at the end of it discussions took place on this, you know, on this issue, on this particular idea of one nation, one election. We have already discussed about this. This means simultaneous elections in both for both Lok Sabha as well as legislative assembly across the country of all state legislative assemblies and also for the national capital territory Delhi and Puducherry, which are two union territories which have legislative assembly. So, Prime Minister Narendra Modi stressed that this formula needs to be accepted even if it takes 100 years to achieve synchronization. So of course, there is a need uh, 10 years to achieve synchronization. So synchronization is basically required because some uh, state legislatures, their term will not get over, say, by 2024. So some are going to have elections later. So synchronization is required, but it may take you know, two terms as such, two looks of our terms eventually to have synchronization. But then this idea has to be implemented is what Prime Minister Narendra Modi stresses on. So, Congress says that this idea of one nation, one election violates basic features of the constitution like flexibility and federalism. So, federalism in the constitution basically is that there is a separate government at the center and separate government in the states, in each state. So, this is bringing in all under one governance as such. So, that is what this idea is interpreted as that government at the center will be the government in all states too because simultaneous elections would be held. So, the psychology of voters while voting, it is, it is interpreted and it is assumed to be such that it would vote for the same political party at the center in all the states. So, if center and states have same political parties then they will not be able to, you know, uh, you know, a demand especially for the states because a compromise if required would may have to be done. So there are such concerns and apprehensions rather whether they are founded or unfounded is another matter. Then another issue, another point which has been highlighted is that uh, you know, a uh, view of former Congress MP Milind Deora, he says that uh, being in continuous election mode is a roadblock to good governance. So that is what happens that when elections are there, then political party leaders, which are also elected in the state or in at the central level, they are continuously campaigning. So it is a roadblock to good governance. They cannot govern, they are busy campaigning because they want to elect win elections too. It distracts politicians from addressing real issues and adds populism to the character of governance. So when there is election due in any region, then for that region, special schemes are announced just for you know becoming popular. To, to get votes. So that is the issue highlighted. CPI and CPI strongly oppose the idea. They say this is why we have separate state elections because of gross misuse of Article 356 of the Constitution. That is President's rule. The central government imposes its rule in the state. So state governments are dissolved. So that is a concern. So that is highlighted. That is why we need separate independent state governments as such. And it says any suppression of the will of the people by prolonging or shortening assembly or parliament is anti-democratic and against federalism. Uh, for even synchronization, this is what will be done. Either some assemblies will get more than the term for which they are elected or get lesser term. So this is called anti-democratic against the uh, against the principles of democracy of elections and those who win elections and have majority stay in power. And it is against federalism that there is a separate constituent states and a central government. Then it says uh, regional parties, uh, some regional parties have supported the idea too, like TRS, Telangana Rashtra Samiti, Biju Janta Dal, YSR Congress, but they are opposed to fixed tenure of legislature. So, okay, simultaneous elections will take place, but then when, if simultaneous elections are proposed, then if government in any state falls, then there is a concern that how then the idea breaks. Because if any, any one state is out of it because it has new elections midway, 
then the idea cannot be implemented. So it, for that, of course, it will be ensured that there is fixed tenure of legislators, that elections can be held only, say, now in 2019, then in 2024, and then in 2029. So then there will be fixed tenure. So uh, Andhra Pradesh Chief Minister Jagan Reddy, he is against this idea of fixed tenure of legislators. He is opposing that. It says, if any state government falls because of certain exigency, you can't prolong the government for simultaneous elections only. If government falls after two years, then re-election with the new government holding power is only for the remaining three-year period. So this should be the case, that if government falls in two years, then if new election, re-election takes place, it should be only for three-year period. Then next is, PM's panel rejects former chief, election, uh, chief economic advisors paper on GDP growth. So this is regarding Aurivin Subramanian paper on India's GDP growth. So Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council has re released a detailed note enumerating its objections to this paper, which former CA Arvind Subramanian has released. It's a paper released in Harvard University. So it postulates that GDP growth between 2011 and 2017 was significantly lower than the 7% shown by official papers. So this report is uh, objected to by the PMEAC, by the governments. So the note rejects the author's methodology, arguments and conclusions. The detail of it is given here, you see that. So here you can see what Supramanium papers uh, finds are, that it, an, it is an analysis of 17 indicators, which suggests that GDP growth between 2011 and 2017 was overestimated. So on this, the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council replies that the 17 indicators looked at are only about industry, manufacturing sector, and uh, nearly 80% of GDP is services and agriculture, which has not been included. So that is one point raised. Then another point is analysis of text data is not included by Subramanian's Arvind Subramanian's paper because changes in the law have rendered the relationship with GDP unstable. So that is the reason given by not putting in text data. But uh, Prime Minister's note says, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council note says that text revenue is hard data. It is only from the government. It cannot come from any other survey or source. So it's not a product of surveys or estimates. So major changes in, uh, so it should be included is the argument. And it's when it says that the changes in it have made it uh, its relationship with GDP unstable. It says major change in taxation which took place was GST, but it did not happen during the period under review 2011 to 2017. And the third point which is there is national account income accounting and methodology of the new series must be reviewed. So this is a suggestion which has been given in Arvind Subramanian's paper. So uh, the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council on this replies that the methodology is in line with transparent and well-managed economy. So it's clear they're not going to review it. Then next is Muzaffarpur acute encephalitis syndrome death toll mounts to 115. So we are seeing the Muzaffarpur district of Bihar where children are suffering from AES and there have been deaths taking place. Now the toll has increased to 115. A PIL has been filed in Patna High Court urging it to direct the state government to take adequate action to contain the outbreak. And they said 138 children have been, uh, are undergoing treatment at KMC Hospital, Shri Krishna Medical College Hospital here in Bihar. So uh, the petition is seeking direction to the central government also to urgently constitute a team of medical experts for the treatment of children suffering from AES in Bihar. So we have already seen in detail about acute encephalitis syndrome, the earlier study too. It has been complete in completely covered in detail in the editorial of 18th June too just two days back. So this is a very important issue. You should know about it. Then next is PM seeks expert team to treat AES patients. So please seek. So this is again regarding the same issue which has been covered. Then next is ozone pollution higher this summer says a center for science and environment. So ozone pollution, so this is ozone, we understand the ozone layer, it is in the stratosphere, which is an important layer in the stratosphere, which protects us from ultraviolet rays, UV rays. So ozone is important in stratosphere, but in the lower atmosphere, that is called surface ozone, and ozone is present in the atmosphere on the lower layer. Uh, so that is called surface ozone. So this surface ozone basically is not a primary pollutant, ozone is formed, because ozone is O3. Oxygen is O2. So actually due to chemical reactions of nitrogen oxide and carbon monoxide in the presence of sunlight, O surface ozone is produced. So it's not a primary pollutant, it's a secondary pollutant because of reactions of the, prim of the primary pollutants. 
so when temperature increases rate of production of ozone also increases because it is produced in the presence of sunlight so this is the issue of ozone pollution surface ozone pollution it say it is said it causes fatigue breathlessness and asthma so now this study of center for science and environment has found it has done an analysis and it has found that ozone pollution in delhi ncr in summer 2019 is high compared to 2018 so this is important you should know basically about summer of uh, about uh, surface ozone so you can see this is stratospheric ozone it absorbs harmful solar radiations at wavelengths less than 320 nanometer protecting living organisms on the surface and this is without ozone of course uv rays would be affecting or there would be no ozone without oxygen so that which is why mars and venus don't have an ozone layer so it is from oxygen that ozone is formed but ozone at the surface forms a pollutant and is harmful for living organisms using humans and plants it's a greenhouse gas the next is pride of place for iisc bengaluru so this is regarding uh, the qs world university rankings for 2020 so under this an indian institute that is iisc bengaluru has been ranked second in the world in one uh, one of the criteria and this criteria is citation by per faculty it means number of citations you know uh, whatever papers they publish citations per faculty so number of citations per faculty is high here so Uh, this is there, but then if you look at the overall score, then still uh, no Indian institute has breached the top hundred barrier in any other indicators. In other indicators which are there, this is one indicator: citation per faculty. Other indicators are like academic reputation, teacher-student ratio, employer reputation, and ratio of international students and faculty. So there, none of the Indian institutes are above or in the top hundred, but then in this one. Uh, indicator iisc bengaluru ranks second in the world so iisc scored perfect 100 in that indicator while five indian institutes of technology iits actually uh, stood in the top 100 ranks so this is the overall ranking also you can see indian institutes ranking like iit bombay has the highest rank at 162 and iit delhi iisc bengaluru comes third so this is given here the next is a lot land or forgo institutes state stored so hrd ministry has warned states that if they fail to allot land for permanent campuses to house centrally funded premier educational institutions like iits and nits national institute of technologies within a stipulated time then they would be shifted to other states because central government announces iits in various locations nits in various locations number of such institutes have been expanded significantly and announcements have been made but still the institutes have not become functional they have been allotted plots for permanent campuses too but they have not still come up because of ecological hurdles like environment ecology hurdles have not got clearances so now ministry of hrd has given them one month deadline Uh, as such for land acquisition of land and starting of construction otherwise because if constructions are delayed it says even the costs increase so that is a concern so they have now been said that if they do it within a stipulated time one month deadline fine otherwise the institute would be shifted to other states so there are five iits which have been announced in jammu dharwad uh, uh, tirupati bhilai and palakkad and they are still in the process of constructing permanent campuses So it says in future no institution will be sanctioned unless land has already been allotted by the state government. So here you can see the list of IITs in India are shown. The new ones have also been announced. So these are all of them shown here. Then next is UP site expected to get national importance tag. So this is an ancient site in Uttar Pradesh in Bagpur district. This is called Sadikpur Sinoli. so this site ha is having uh, what has been uncovered are objects uh, with chariots swords etc pointing to the presence of a warrior class and th these objects belong to around 4000 years ago so this site could be declared as a site of national importance so you should know about this sadikpur sinoli so archaeological survey of india has started the process of declaring this site which site which spreads over 28 hectares as a site of national importance so you can see the among the treasures on earth there are three chariots legged coffins shields swords and helmets all of which point towards a warrior class and they belong to around 2500 bc 
4000 years ago so that is the time of the late harappan period so it is also said to be the largest necropolis of the late harappan period city as such then next is joint election must not must delhi high court ruled in 2009 so we are seeing the supreme court has been petitioned by congress for the separate elections for by polls for two rajya sabha seats so two rajya sabha seats have got vacant in gujarat because bjp president amit shah and union minister smriti rani they were elected to lok sabha presently so they have uh, resigned from their rajya sabha seats which have fall, fallen vacant and these seats are from gujarat so by, by elections would be held for these two seats but the election commission has announced separate elections for them separately so that has been protested against and gujarat congress has challenged it in the supreme court so an earlier ruling of the supreme court has been but has been mentioned by even by the election commission of india this is satyapal malik versus election commission of india case of 2009 in which the delhi high court had ruled that it was not mandatory to join, hold joint elections in case of casual vacancies so there are six casual vacancies in the rajya sabha presently from gujarat as well as from bihar and odisha then next is car bomb used to target army patrol vehicle so this is regarding the recent attack which took place in pulwama it was on 17 june 2019 a terror attack took place on an army patrol vehicle on the arihal pulwama road in south kashmir so a maruti 800 car was is suspected to have been used and an ied improvised explosive device was packed in the car which was parked by the road and was detonated when a mobile vehicle patrol of rashtriya rifles passed by so in this two army personnel were killed and six others injured so nia a national investigation agency visited the scene of the explosion and collected samples for forensic examination you should know nia national investigation agency which investigates into terror related cases is also investigating the february 14 2019 pulwama terror attack case also another case which has come before it is regarding the march 30 2019 case in which some terrorists exploded a car laden with explosives near banihal in jammu and kashmir so it was in grave with the intention of killing the crpf jawans so all these cases are been investigated by nia nia's investigation in the february 14 pulwama attack is stuck it is said because agency is yet to trace the source of explosives used so initial post blast analysis was done for the pulwama terror attack case of feb 14 by nsg national security guard as after the attack and it said uh, that the rdx was used a high grade military explosive which is of which is mostly found in army stores so now because of such incidents extra measures are been taken to sanitize routes because even the amarnath yatra in jammu and kashmir is going to commence on july 1 so more than 2 lakh pilgrims are expected to visit the shrine and around 30000 security forces have been deployed for the yatra safety we have discussed about amarnath yatra to earlier the next is un report links mbs to kashogi killing so it is said there is credible evidence linking saudi crown prince mohammed bin salman mbs to the murder of journalist jamal kashogi so this is actually a report by a un expert so it is un special report here on extra judicial summary or arbitrary execution so it's a new report which calls for sanctions on the crown prince's foreign assets so jamal kashogi case was prominently in news sometime back it was uh, every day uh, up in news and this special report your report is actually a report which is uh, of the human rights expert him independent report it is not speaking for the united nations but it has called on in this report that the un secretary general antonio guterres has to initiate formal international criminal investigation into the case so this is regarding Jam- jamal kashoggi he is a saudi he was a saudi journalist who was killed in istanbul consulate so you can see it was in september 2018 that kashogi and his fiance visited saudi arabia's istanbul consulate unannounced seeking a certificate so and uh, on that date itself you can see kashogi fl- flew to london but before that information on him was released to riyadh so you can see on october 1 then five saudi men later identified as part of a 15 member team involved in the killing arrived in istanbul so it was in istanbul turkey where he was located he had gone to the saudi consulate there. in istanbul so you can see so that was where he was killed and then information was not given earlier saudi said that they are not aware what happened he said he left the consulate later it was from, was known that he did not leave the consulate and then they admitted that yes he was killed but there are there is nothing which is there so you know, no evidence the, this member's body is not there it, it is said even the 
in the, in the consulate has been cleaned, forensically cleaned. So it, uh, people involved, it is linked to Muhammad bin Sultan. That he, it is his hand in this uh, attack. He was a dissident Saudi journalist. Then next is Banks Association tweaks intercreditor agreement. So Indian Banks Association have tweaked the intercreditor agreement that was framed by the Sashakt Committee. So this has to be tweaked because there are revised guidelines from RBI now on stressed asset resolution which were announced on June 7. Its earlier resolution was uh, ruled, was appealed to in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court had asked for modification. So that has been done by RBI. So earlier, uh, earlier uh, rules, guidelines of RBI were that even if there is one day's default, then it has to be considered as a stressed asset. But these revised norms mandate that if there is a default of any lender, all lenders should review the borrower's account within 30 days. Not one day now, within 30 days of the default. So this is called the review period of one month, 30 days. And in this time, they will chalk out a resolution plan. So these changes which have been announced, RBI has said that intercreditor agreement must be formulated within this review period by the lenders by the banks involved and uh, it says that any decision agreed to by lenders representing 75 percent of value of total outstanding credit loan credit facilities loan and 60 percent of lenders by number then any decision is taken by this uh, such group of lenders then it will be binding on all the lenders so that is the intercreditor agreement process and this uh, this intercreditor agreement which has been accepted is by the Sashak committee is by as many as 36 banks and financial institutions so those recommendations were you know endorsed by these banks and now it has been tweaked by the indian banks association to comply with the revised guidelines or as per the revised guidelines so this is regarding project Sashak 2 it was mr mehta panel which recommended this uh, these five pronged approach for resolution of loans so public sector banks have to take lead in setting up asset management company for loans above 50 500 crore rupees is one of the recommendations lead bank to implement resolution plan in 180 days but now review period is only of 30 days so this was then so that is the intercreditor agreement within 30 days. So resolution of assets would take place later. So for that, it is six month period given. And this is the intercreditor agreement. It is also detailed out. This is also this was also a question in UPSC prelims 2019. So it's a master agreement among banks and financial institutions that sets broad framework for resolution of stress assets. So stress assets of 50 crore or more come under consortium lender lending so they will have an intercreditor agreement because such loans are not from one bank itself but are from a consortium a group of banks so they have an intercreditor agreement amongst them so that the person who has defaulted the company which has defaulted how do they get back their uh, asset from it so this is the detail regarding icl and this is regarding the recent changes which rbi announced so this 30 day default period uh, within 30 days of default review period as it is called the intercreditor agreement has to implement resolution plan then within 180 days from end of review period and there's disincentive for banks if they delay implementing viable resolution plan if they fail to uh, uh, have this resolution plan in place within 180 days then there will be extended uh, uh, what is it called it is provisioning more provisioning more percentage of provisioning means they have to keep separate money for such uh, bad assets so they will have to do more provisioning in those cases but if they implement the resolution plan and or they approach the uh, ibc that is insolvency and bankruptcy court uh, the ibc court as such then the provisioning which extended provisioning higher provisioning it is there that will be eliminated this is the process R this is the way rbi have given fresh guidelines the next is finance minister holds talks with financial sector regulators on budget so finance minister nirmala sitharaman reviewed the state of the economy and discussed various budget related suggestions and proposals at meeting with financial sector regulators so india's economy is hitting has hit a five year low of growth at 6.8 percent in 2018-19 so, and now a budget is to be announced on july 5. so financial sec sector regulators means rbi sebi insurance regulatory and development authority etc and there's also a body called financial stability and development council which is headed by the finance minister himself so the first meeting of this body fsdc also took place in 2011 so it has been set up to deal with financial stability financial sector development interregulatory coordination financial literacy financial inclusion etc 
so it is uh, having uh, in the department of economic affairs of the ministry of finance and it is expected to coordinate the country's international interface with financial sector bodies too like fatf financial stability board etc so you should know financial stability and development council is headed by the finance minister and this is regarding how government has expanded it to so you know more secretaries as such have been involved chairperson of insolvency board is also now part of fsbc etc and last news is won't allow uh, second last news actually won't allow fdi in multi brand retail predatory pricing so this is commerce minister piyush goyal who has reiterated in central government's you find that it will not allow foreign direct investment in multi brand retail so single brand retail has fdi 100% fdi means only one brand can be sold at a particular shop not a number of brands so it has assured small traders that it could not allow multi brand retail fdi as such and also it will not allow predatory pricing by multinationals predatory pricing also what is it will discuss below so these are anti competitive practices so here you can see regarding fdi also in 1995 wto was formed uh, you know wto's general agreement on trade and services which includes both and wholesale and retail services have come it has come into effect and india allowed fdi in cash and carry in wholesale sector with 100% rights under the government approval route in 1997 fdi is foreign direct investment foreign investors coming in and setting up here 2006 we allowed allowed fdi in cash and carry under wholesale route under automatic route not government approval so that is still more No, not as stringent as government approval. And up to fifty-one percent investment in single brand retail was also allowed in two thousand six. And in two thousand eleven, hundred percent FDI in single brand retail was permitted, but no FDI in multi brand retail. So recent, uh, recently also hundred percent FDI in food retail has been allowed. But what is being uh, called for is not just food retail, but other items also. FMCGs is what they what these. Uh, bodies like grofers with big basket they want allowing uh, government to allow them to have other aspects to included so that their profits increase like personal care household items which are made in india so it's 100% has been allowed with limit for sale of such items to be capped at 25% so this uh, was the demand and it was expected to take place but uh, presently so far 100% fdi is allowed only in single brand retail and this is predatory pricing explained so predatory predator means a and like an animal which eats up another animal so that is the predator and the victim so if one firm is a predator it sets a price it means that it sets a price low enough that the predator and its prey and its victim loses money so it's a price uh, so low that the predator makes sure that the second firm loses money means it will mean a loss and second firm goes out of business and then the first firm becomes uh, you know dominant and it can increase the price to restore its profits so that's called predatory pricing which is an anti competitive practice and is not allowed in india as well as internationally and the last news is cancer cell detection dots developed from food. so this is a team of scientists from assam which have developed a chemical process that turns dirty coal into biomedical dots which can detect cancer cells so these are called carbon quantum dots they are you no know, of many applications so these are nano materials carbon quantum dots which are produced from cheap abundant low quality and high sulfur coals which are found in india so these are carbon based nano nano materials nano material means they are of size less than 10 nanometer so you can see that these carbon based nano materials can be used as diagnostic tools for bioimaging especially in detecting cancer cells for chemical sensing and also in optoelectronics so they have been developed by scientists from assam they have applied for a patent for the chemical method for producing this carbon quantum dots so here you can see they have developed these fluorescent carbon nano materials which is at 120th the cost of imported carbon quantum dots and the source material is abundant low quality indian coal not directly suitable for thermal electricity production but suitable for carbon quantum dots which a future which is a futuristic material whose which is in demand in india as well so this is a quantum dot a crystal which is few nanometers away it's made from semiconductor such as silicon but this is carbon quantum dot which we are talking about right so these are the news items thank you